was looking over here at little Mike Powell giving me the eyeball before I took him out. We were eating out today, and, and, and Mike was uh, feeding his, uh, his grandson. And uh, I thought, oh, isn't that something? That's, that's just so sweet. And then I thought about how m awful that must be for that little child. But, uh, <laughs> oh, that was good. Let's pray for Miss uh, Clifton in the hospital, if you will. And then uh, Brother Larry, his family, uh, a home going of a loved one. Uh, keep him in prayer. And then uh, keep our church in prayer as you look for a pastor for you here in this place. And, of course, we appreciate your prayers for us as we go and begin another ministry and uh, so uh, we trust that the Lord will bless all of us all of the way through and uh, how many of you have an unspoken request for prayer let's see all right just about everybody let's pray together father we come to you tonight thanking you that we can hold in our hands the precious word of God we can open it and we can take it into our heart and into our mind and into our thinking it directs our path it gives direction it gives light and Father, we're thankful that the Word of God leads us day by day. Lord, help us not to make a decision unless it's based on Scripture and the Holy Spirit of God leading us, guiding us, directing us every step of the way. And Father, I pray that you'll bless this service tonight. I pray the Lord Jesus will be lifted up. I pray that you'll give peace to your people and unity to your people. Bless those that are ill, give healing. And Lord, we pray that you'll direct the church and the looking for a pastor. We pray that you'll direct their path. And Father, we pray that the church will continue to increase in love and faith and in holiness. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to move forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated, if you will, please. We uh, got a call from Raleigh this week, and they wanted to interview me for the paper. They're going to do an article on the new pastor. And one of the questions they ask is, what was one of your most embarrassing moments? Of course, I had to give the infamous rabbit story, <laughs> and uh, they they really they, they really loved that. And uh, I'm just glad that there was no pictures to be able, that no one could send up there. And uh, thank God for good things, Amen. But uh, anyway, we've had some great times here. What are you laughing at? Be quiet. <laughs> you this, this this is my good side. This is my right here. Uh, but we've had some good times. I want to say one other thing, and I meant to say that in, in the sermon this morning. I want to say one, one thing tonight. In the 12, almost 12 years I've been here, we've worked hard at bringing you some of the best speakers in America, men that will help you and men that will encourage you. We try to do revivals and missions and Bible conferences and family life conferences and uh, pray over them. And uh, can I say something that, that might help the new pastor coming in? I want to say to you uh, that we're here for every service. There were some of you that never missed a service. You know, I think about people who drove from Monk's Corner and John over on John's Island and people that just drove for long distances, and they're here every service. What an encouragement that is to a pastor uh, to know you can have a service and bring God's man in and the people will come, and that's a great encouragement. Please remember that in the future. But what a discouragement it is is when you work hard and a church puts out a lot of money to bring a man in, and then folk, uh, they know what the schedule is. Well, I'm going to be away, preacher. I, I've just, I've got to be away. And, and with no thought of arranging your schedule to where you could be here for something planned for you. Now, people get sick. We know that. And people have to work. We know that. But I'm talking about just, you know, you need to, to plan. Uh, plan your, your schedule around the church's schedule as much as you can. Because that will help you and that will help your family. And so when the new pastor comes in, get behind him in every way and be here. And, you know, you, you may say, I don't have a lot to contribute. Well, your presence is a lot. Just your presence is a lot. And then the other things that you uh, can do. All right, Lucille, come up to the platform. I want to embarrass Lucille one more time before I go. And uh, today's her birthday. She's only 25, but being married to John, she looks a little older. <laughs> And so, Lucille, we have some flowers for you on your birthday, and uh, there you are. And we also, Michael, if the associate will, if the associate will wake up, we also have a little something for a love offering here. And we want Thank you to you have that. Much. Lord bless you. Thank you so much. Amen.
And Mike, I had something for you, but I forgot it. All right, let's move on. Okay, I got to get him one more time before he leaves. <laughs> we was back there in the prayer meeting tonight, and him and Brother Dean Mitchell was talking. And Brother Bob said they went to Captain Dean's day to get dinner. And Brother Mitchell and them was there. I said, well, you know why that is, Brother Mitchell? He said, why is that, Brother Tommy? I said, well, I never could let it learn him to catch no fish, so he had to go to Captain D's to get the fish. <laughs> and we used to go fishing. I'd wonder why all I'd be going down the lake, I don't care if it's 60 mile an hour, five mile an hour, he'd be dragging my big fish net. I know now why. He was dragging the lake for the golf balls. He didn't catch golf balls, no fish, so that's <laughs> it. <laughs> okay, let's pray. I had him, Father, thank you, Lord, for another wonderful day. I had him, Father, thank you now for the many, many blessings you bestowed upon us. I have all we thank you now for the last 12 years, Brother Bob. We pray the Lord as he goes to the new church. You just bless him and the new church in a mighty, mighty way. I pray the Lord you be with us tonight now as we look for a pastor. Be with us. And I have all we just thank you for the many, many years we've had here and what Brother Bob has done for getting us out of debt. And I have all we pray for the offer now as we take it tonight. We pray the Lord be used for your honor and your glory. And I have all we thank you now for our missionaries all throughout the world. Be with each and every one of them. And our price is chest, dear Lord. We have names of loved ones, friends, and that the Lord may just pray that one of these days, each one will, will take you as their personal Savior, and the price of the chest can be completely empty. We pray now, the Lord, if you date the orphan, pray that you bless the gift and the giver, and also bless those who are unable to give. It will be used for your honor and for your glory. For all we ask to say in Jesus Christ, in name, Isaiah Christ chapter 26, Amen. if you'll turn there, and then Philippians, the book of Philippians, chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, Isaiah chapter 26. And in these passages of Scripture, let's look tonight at the peaceful mind. Isaiah 26, verse 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Then look at Philippians 2, Philippians 2, Verse 5, Philippians 2, verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Look at chapter 4. Three of my favorite passages in all of the Bible. Favorite verses here. Philippians 4, verse 5. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful or be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God, which patheth all understanding, shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Bow with me in prayer, if you will. Let's ask the Lord to speak to our heart. Father, thank you for good friends. Thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ, so faithful, so dedicated. And thank you, Father, for the past, the present, and the future. And Father, again, we know that the future for this church is as bright as the promises of God. And Father, I pray that you'll help this church to stay on course. Lord, I pray that you'll help the church to remember that we're not cruise directors, but we're ship builders. And Father, we will stay at the task of building ships that will last and that will stand the rigors of the storms and will set out for a course and will not deviate until it comes on shore. But Father, as we go through this life, Satan would disturb us. Fears and frustrations on every hand. So many things to take away our peace. National events personal things, but yet your word standeth sure. And so, Lord, I pray that today, as we look into the word of God tonight, as we think about this passage of scripture, that you might uh, help us to humble ourselves before thee, cast our cares upon you, because you care for us. Speak to hearts, in Jesus' name, amen. Preacher was riding on a plane, I read the story this week from a northern town to uh, Atlanta, sat down beside a lady that he could tell was going through some problems. Tears were in her eyes, and he said to her, Ma'am, I'm a preacher, 
and I know the Lord Jesus as my Savior. Is there anything I can do to help you? What's, what's wrong? And through the tears, she told this story. She said, I worked hard, very, very hard to pay for my husband's education. We decided that it would be better for him to have a college education than myself, although I wanted to go to college. But we thought it was best if I paid for the education I worked while he went to school. He did so. He graduated with honors and uh, made a success as a, of himself as a lawyer and uh, said for a while things were wonderful and we had everything she said we just had everything we had the cars we had the houses uh, we had everything and i was so happy for a while and then all of a sudden he uh, came to me and he said uh, you know i can't go on like this uh, the people that i run with and uh, my friends you're just not educated enough, you're not polished enough, and you're an embarrassment to me, and uh, I have made provisions for a divorce. And because he was a lawyer and because he was shrewd, she was left with nothing. She said, I'm on my way now to Atlanta to live with my sister, and she's promised to help me. The lack of peace be gone just like that. Stability in this life can be gone in a second. There are so many things that will trouble your mind and trouble your heart and trouble your spirit and will cause you to turn away from a peaceful heart and a, a, a peaceful mind. Uh, there are several things that will rob you of peace. There are several things that will rob you of joy. One is circumstances. If you live by circumstances, then they'll rob you of joy. If you live from one day to the next, from one paycheck to the next, if you uh, live by circumstances, they'll rob you of your joy. They'll rob you of your peace. Worry is something that will rob you of your peace. And the Bible warns that we're to, to not to, to worry, that we're not to fret. Being concerned is one thing. Worrying is another. And here's what the Bible says. Don't be anxious for anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God. Now watch. The peace of God that passeth all understanding shall guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Are you worried tonight? It's because you're not following this verse. Are you fearful tonight? It's because you're not praying in every area. You're not wrapping uh, your heart uh, around your heart with prayer, your mind uh, with prayer. Your life is not protected uh, by prayer. Be right with God and know that you're right with God. And then pray every day and pray for God's peace and pray for His protection and pray for His power because His peace will protect you. Circumstances will rob you. Worry will rob you. Uh, people can take away your peace. People can be mean, and they can be cruel, and people change. Jesus never changes, amen? amen? But people change and can change. Your best friends can change. Let me say this to you. Those that are your best friends today might be your worst enemy tomorrow. Those that are patting you on the back today may try to stick a knife in your back tomorrow. Those that are saying kind things to you to your face may be behind the scenes saying things against you. And people can rob you of your joy. And thank God for people. And thank God for fellowshipping with, with people and for good Christians. But keep your mind stayed upon Jesus Christ. And keep your mind stayed upon Him and everything will be all right. Things will rob you of joy. Things. If you're living for things, if you're living for the houses and for the cars, uh, and you're living for the paychecks, and if you're living for those things, you're going to be disappointed. And all of these things will take away peace from your heart and peace from your mind. Dr. Warren Wiersbe, in his book on Philippians, he entitles that book, The Christ-like Mind. Now think about this. The Christ-like Mind that brings Christian joy. Now that's something I need to cultivate. That's something that you need to cultivate. World affairs uh, dictate that you and I need the peace of God. And uh, at your job, wherever you're working at, uh, will dictate that you need the peace of God. Relationships in family will dictate that you need the peace of God. I don't care how much love you have for your wife or for your husband. Eventually, there's going to be little things and they'll begin to drive a wedge uh, between you and little attitudes and little uh, the spirit of the thing sometimes. And that's why you and I need the peace of God and the power of God. 
uh, to protect us. And so developing a Christ-like mind, how important that is. And here's what Dr. Wearsby says in the book of Philippians. He talks about chapter 1. He says chapter 1 dictates to us or depicts to us the single mind. The single mind. I have my heart and my mind fixed on one thing, and that's pleasing God and living for the Lord Jesus Christ and being right. And I'm confident that He's working in me, he says. Look at verse 10, that I may, chapter 1, verse 10, that I may approve things that are excellent, that uh, ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, unto the glory and praise of God. So you understand what he's saying here? A single mind. The Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You can't hold on to the world with this hand and hold on to the things of God with that hand and have peace. You cannot do it. Uh, you cannot think uh, positive doctrinal thoughts and, and, and let evil come into your mind. You can't do that. And you'll be stretched and you'll be pulled apart. Uh, you can't begin your day with walking with the Lord and thinking about Him and then let every other thing distract you uh, from the peace of God. You just simply cannot do that. So have a single mind. Lord, I'm living for You today. And I'm going to serve you today. I'm going to do what's right today. I have my mind and my heart focused on the things of God. In chapter 2, Dr. Wearsby says we need to develop a submissive mind. A submissive mind. If Jesus, while he was here on this earth, was submissive to the will of, Father, of the Father, how much more important is it for you and I uh, to be submissive to our Heavenly Father? Lord, what will you have me to do? Where will you have me to go? Uh, who will you have me to marry? What college will you have me to attend? What vocation should I get involved in? What, what is it that you want me to do? And being submissive to the Lord in every area of your life. Dr. Wearsby says, chapter 3, you need to develop a spiritual mind. A spiritual mind. And he talks about uh, the things that are spiritual. Look at verse 7 of chapter 3, a great passage here. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Listen to this. Yea, doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may, be, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. A spiritual mind. Ask God to help you to develop a spiritual mind, that your mind is filled with spiritual things and the thoughts of the Lord. And then Dr. Wearsby points out chapter 4 is a secure mind. A secure mind. You found that in verse 5, verse 6, verse 7. But you find it also in verse 8. Finally, my brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are just, uh, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, watch it. Think on these things. Think on these things. Look at verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Content. Boy, contentment's a great gift, isn't it? Not torn in many different directions, uh, no upheavals, but just absolutely content and content and content uh, concerning the things of God. Now go back to Isaiah, the very first verse that we read tonight, chapter 26, and look at verse 3. Here's a great passage of Scripture. For years, when I wake up of a morning, I've had a habit of doing the same things. First of all, I put on the whole armor of God mentally. Uh, Lord, help me to be strong in the Lord and the power of your might. I now by faith take on the whole armor of God. And Lord, I put on the helmet of salvation and the breastplate of righteousness, loins girt about with truth, and feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Help me to take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and the shield of faith, where I might be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Next thing I do is I begin to pray certain verses out to the Lord and ask Him to help me to live by these verses. And I quote them again and again. And I'll start out my day like this. Lord, help me to live out in my life Psalms 1. And I quote it. And Psalms 23, and I quote it. And then I come to Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. And then I go to the New Testament. But I come to this verse every day. And I'll say, Lord, help me to live out in my life this verse, Isaiah 26, 3. Thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. When you're, when you're a pastor, there's, there's too much at stake not to have peace of mind. First of all, you've got to be right with God yourself. And, and that's, that's a job, just keeping yourself right. Amen? 
I mean, you people that always think about others, I don't know how you make it. You ought to have, I've got more trouble thinking about me. I mean, D.L. Moody said, the, my worst enemy is the man I look in the mirror and see every morning. And uh, work on old, old self and get self right. And then you think about a family. You're responsible for a family. I know why Paul said, uh, it's better for you to remain as I if you're not married. I know why he said that, because to do what he did, a family, he would not have been able to accomplish maybe what he did because of caring for a wife and children. And he could not have been the missionary that he was. And I know a little bit about that. I know a little bit about the, the battle of, of keeping the family right and knowing that the family is looking at you and watching you. And, and, and you must be right if you're going to lead your family. And if a preacher can't uh, lead his family, if his family doesn't respect him, he can't be a pastor. He, if he can't rule his house, he can't rule the church. Now, that doesn't mean that his children are perfect. By the way, let me just insert something. If the pastor comes in here for you and he has children, you be very careful how you treat the children. And be careful not to demand more of them than you do of your children because they have the same feelings that you do and that your children do. And they have the same temptations that you and your children have. And don't try to hurt them and put them up because uh, they're a, P a PK. Uh, they're not going to be perfect. And you know why? Because they'll run with the deacon's kids. And pretty soon they'll run them. Amen? And uh, uh, so be very, very careful. I made a mistake early on. I told you about it in the ministry. I, I was too hard early on on my children because I wanted them to be, you know, way up above uh, every. And, you know, I discovered that their kids just like it. Have a, let them have a good time. And let them be kids and uh, just love them. And I knew they weren't going to be perfect, but I knew one thing that, that I needed from them, and that was their respect of mom and dad. And I'm going to say something tonight uh, on this last Sunday night. My three children have not been perfect, but there's one thing I can say about them. They've always respected their dad and their mother. They've respected adults. They say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. And they love, they've been that way. And I, and I think in, in that way, uh, Sue and I have been a success uh, in raising our children because they still respect us. They're still our best friends. I told the people up at Raleigh, the men, they asked me a question, and I said, my best friends are my two sons and my daughter. They are. And, uh, and we tolerate Ken. And... Uh, uh, and, and to be very honest with you, I'm going to have to adopt him. He needs so much help. He needs me. He really does. He needs me. And then you think about the church. You've got a pastor of the church and people in the church with problems and, and all of the rest of it and the, the counseling sessions. You, you, many of you do not know the hours and hours and hours that I've spent in counseling. You're gone out doing things. I'm in the office counseling hours upon hours upon hours and listening to people's problems. That's hard work. Just try sitting for an hour listening to people's problems and giving answers. That'll wear you out. You'll sleep good at night after you've done a few, a few of that, especially if you've counseled John Cross. And, buddy, you go to sleep just like that. And uh, so all of that. And you have to have the peace of God. Amen? So here's what he said. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace. The word keep there is to guard from danger. Guard from danger. Thou wilt keep him in perfect. The word perfect there is complete tranquil sound. Isn't that good? Perfect peace, whose mind is stayed, who has confidence in the Word of God and confidence in God because he trusteth in thee, because he rests upon the Lord, because he braces himself up against the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou keep him in perfect peace. That's it, isn't it? We need peace. You need peace individually tonight. I need peace. All of us needs peace. Peace of mind. You're going through a, a transition. I'm going through a transition. And we both, you and I, will need the peace of God. And the new pastor will need the peace of God. I'm going to a church of over 500 people on Sunday morning and about 350 on Sunday night and a Christian school of about 420. But I've done that before. I've been there, done that. I've been in a school of over 800 and in pastor a church of over 500. I've been there, done that. Uh, if, you, if you want to look at it this way, I can do it. I can do it. Uh, but it'll be just the motions unless I have the power of God and the peace of God. And you and I need that. Now that's the introduction, Clint. And uh, that's the introduction, Harold. And now we're going to get to the main body of the sermon tonight. The peace of God. How do you do that? Well, number one, you've got to understand the mind. 
You've got to understand the mind. Jesus said in Philippians, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind, the brain. What a, what a tremendous gift from God. Do you realize, listen, do you realize that every word you've ever heard is still lodged in the brain? Do you realize every sight that you've ever seen with the eye is still hidden away in the brain somewhere? Have you ever been walking down the street or in a situation and you stopped and you thought, I've been here before. I've seen this before, but you never have. Well, it's just simply the mind working because you've been somewhere else very similar to that. And the mind, the brain just working to bring back that picture. And uh, you see, every scene is lodged away there. Listen again. Every emotion that you've ever had, every emotion, every feeling that you've ever had is still in that brain, lodged in that brain somewhere. Now listen very carefully. That's why that if a little boy or a little girl is brought up in a home where there's fear and where they're not loved, and when daddy comes through the door, they're, they're fearful rather than running to the door to daddy. If they had a mother that's given to, to yelling and screaming and unkindness, all of those emotions are still there. And that's why many times in adulthood that when things get tough, we revert back to being a little boy. We revert back to being a little girl because those hurts were there. And listen to me, the devil has a way of manipulating you into a situation and bringing back to your mind, to your thinking, to your feeling, those childhood feelings, those childhood emotions. That's why you have to have the mind of Christ. That's why you have to have the peace of God. And if a little boy or a little girl is fearful and, and, and afraid early in life, that's why we need to give a little boy or a little girl peace at home and tranquility and love. Let me tell you something. You can't love your little boy enough. And you can't love your little girl enough. Look, you, it'd be much better for you ladies to quit thinking about all those new dresses and fashion and just love your kids. That's why it'd be much better for some of you men maybe make a little less money and just spend time with that boy. Play ball with him. Let him know you love him. And let that little girl know you love her. You will not regret it. And you, you'll, you'll be a better man. You'll be a better woman for that. If those, that, those little children have wonderful memories of childhood and you build a tradition with them and they know that mom and dad love them and mom and dad cares, they'll grow up and they'll, be, they'll develop into uh, society and strong pillars of society. And so I want to say to every man in here tonight and every woman in here tonight, if you have little children, you just love them and spend time with them. Now, you may have several children, but you can spend time with them. You know what I suggest? One night of the week, spend time with one. The next, another. The next, another. Then spend time all together, and uh, you'll have a great time. Some of the greatest memories that I have is when we played ball together. And I'm sorry. So many memories run through your mind, and I apologize, but we'll get through it. I still have in my office a trophy when Rob and Jim played their first Little League t-ball and they won the league that year and I have the trophy and they presented it to me, the team did, they presented it to me and I have in, in that trophy an old rubber ball that Rob and Jim and I played with when they were boys. I don't want to get rid of it. Memories, you see. And uh, if the Lord tarries and I go off to heaven, they'll remember Dad. See? And uh, I'm just saying to you parents, love your kids. Give them a strong heart and a strong mind. And if there's some of you folk here tonight that you are a little upset because the teenagers are in here, get over it. If you think, that they're, if you think they're a detriment to this church, get over it. No, oh, these kids, I'm glad they're here. And I'm glad they're sitting here. And maybe their parents, maybe they don't spend as much time with them. I don't know, but you spend time with them. 
uh, so that they can have a peaceful uh, heart and a, a great uh, a growing up. Uh, you see, the mind is a uh, it brings together all of our emotions. It's a processor of emotions and feelings. Now, the devil knows that. The devil knows that. And the devil knows how to get you away from the power of God and the peace of God so that you get all frustrated and, and fearful and emotions will take over. The devil knows how to just to work it so you'll be angry. And some of us are angry about the same things over and over again. We've gotten in a trap. We've gotten into a pattern of being angry. And the devil knows that. And he'll bring up feelings and situations that cause us to lash out. And it hurts us and it hurts others. And we'll never be able to get past it. And you just think about how the mind works. It gathers bits of information, millions and millions and millions of bits of information stored away. And uh, these uh, little bits of information uh, will cause us to think and to react and will help us to be have security or will help us to have ill will. Uh, think about that. And uh, think about how the brain works. Uh, the brain is actually in, in, is put together in two hemispheres, uh, the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. And between the, the right and left hemisphere, there are connectors. Now, men... Every man, the connect, there's about two or three connectors between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. Ladies, there's about a hundred connectors between the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere. You know why that is? Because women use both sides of their brain at the same time. Men use one side of the brain. Now, men are given to facts. Listen to me. Men Get by the mic.